I think what's important when you do bets like that is to be very honest with yourself as a company and define clear success, what success looks like. And after a few weeks or months, decide if you want to drop it or continue invest. And that's, I think, what's difficult because you have tons of opportunity every week and you need to pick them. Welcome to the seed stage. I'm your host, Enzo, CEO at June. Every week, June and Point9 invite the most inspiring product and growth leaders to share their practical advice on how to grow your SaaS. Whether this is a story behind a feature, a marketing framework, or a risky update made on the pricing, we're digging ideas you and your team can put in place next week. No fuzz, no BS. Enjoy the show. Hi, Olivier, and welcome to the show. How are things? Good. Thanks, Enzo, for hosting me today. Really excited to have you, especially because today is a premiere for two reasons. The first one is because you're B2C, you're working for a B2C product. And it's one of the first time we're having a B2C product on the show, but we're really excited to have one because uh, I really love the product, I have to say, and I'm sure there is lots of learnings that are applicable. And the second one is because Luis, Luis Copé, is joining me as the co-host today. Hi, Luis. Hey, Enzo. Hi, Olivier. Well, great to have you, Luis. As you heard in the jingle, we've decided to partner with our friends at Point9 to run the future of the podcast. And so we're making them part of the conversation, like today, so that can bring their domain expertise and yield richer conversations and more insight for you. Glad to be on the show today and to partner with you on that. And though, as some of you might know, like sharing best practices has been one of the kind of corner piece of our work at Point9, like my partner, Christophe started doing this close to uh, more than 10 years ago with his The Angel VC blog. And we've all done that. And, you know, podcasting is one of the most interesting ways to get in front of interesting people and share best practices. So very happy to be here with you and with Olivier as well. Awesome. So with that being said, let's move on. I would like to do a short intro about you, Oliver, because I assume some people might not know you. So you're currently the VP of Growth at Photoroom, which is a mobile and web app that uses deep learning and Gen AI to create and enhance images in second. You guys have more than 100 million installs and you empower resellers, small businesses, marketplaces, so they can create their studio quality images. Prior to Photo Room, you were at Molotov TV, which is a leading French online TV platforms where you led the marketing department, including the acquisition, the retention, the brand, the data, the customer success. That's a lot. I want to touch on that. Your team also drew off some pretty amazing results including growing by 5x the paid subscribers base. You have a background as an analyst and you're also a growth advisor during your free time. Yes, exactly. Long time in the app marketing world indeed. Long journey. Before we dive into concrete examples, because I feel this is, you know, what everyone wants to know when you talk about growth, I'd like to talk about the foundations of your job. So at Molotov, you covered so many things, including brand and CS, which are things you don't do at Photo Room, right? You seem to be a bit more narrow in your focus in a way. I love to understand how you think about growth and the purpose of your role in this world. Growth encompass a lot of different topics depending on each company, depending if you are B2C, B2B, depending if you are available everywhere in the world or if you are focusing on one market, depending on your market as well. So there is a ton of things. So if I have to describe what the foundation of growth, I think in a startup scale up, especially after the market fit, it's about uh, giving a pulse to the company. It's about who are joining a startup or a scale-up are looking for. They want uh, the company to grow. Usually they are also looking for uh, growth in terms of skills and career. If I explain my role at Photo Room as VP Growth is yeah, leading the team and also infusing this mindset of growth in everything we do, like looking to the next mile, being proud of what we are doing and trying to grow in every aspect of the company. I think there is two aspects in the role of VP growth in a scale-up, at least for an app. It's it's about chasing any short-term opportunity in terms of growth, making sure that we are not missing yeah, anything on the short term, but also working, and it's a bigger job, but working on long-term strategic bet in a way. So it's about challenging on the day-to-day the growth team and also discussing with other leaders of the room, what should we do next in the next one year, two years, to not only improve the, the kind of local growth, but look at the next 10x for Photo Room. For an app, a B2C app at least, and that's what we apply at Photo Room, growth is about acquisition, revenue growth, or improving the profitability. So specifically at Photo Room, we have a paid acquisition team, which is focusing on every week, driving more, more traffic, more install, more subscriber to Photo Room. And we have also a product growth team, same 
They operate on a weekly basis. They test every week new stuff into the onboarding, into new stuff in the paywall. They have new ideas about how we can improve the early funnel. And we have also some people dedicated to international. And here, this, this bit the same idea is how we can get short-term wins, easy wins by tweaking a bit the product, improving the localization, speaking with the right person in Japan or in Korea. Yeah, that's what the team is doing on a daily basis. And you seem to be focused a lot on like, you know, short-term wins left and right. Yeah. How do you balance long-term versus short-term? Yeah, my team is specifically dedicated on these short-term loops. But when we think about growth, we look at what could increase significantly for the room revenue by in two years or three years. And because we don't know it today what will work in three years from now. And we have this idea of experimentation is key at photo room, but also listening to our user speed and having people focusing. And we don't think we can focus on many things. So my team is focusing on delivering the growth on the market fit we know, the B2C apps. And we have other small teams working on the next big thing for photo room. So could be the API, could be around collaboration in the app, this kind of topics, for example. So to recap, there is a product growth team in charge of like the early funnel. Yeah. An advertising team, kind of, that is in charge of like fueling the funnel. And then you have yes. the internationalization teams, right? So these are the three main functions yes. you, you have kind of with you. And CRM. Yeah. As well, yep. uh, as I didn't mention, which is about emailing, push, you know, messages. And we see two use cases for this thing. It's, of course, educating the user or promoting a photo room through the email channel. But it's also about gathering feedback. The easiest way to learn is to put a survey into our app right after the onboarding or after a few days. And we have the information after a few days, basically. So these channels are always two ways, right? Like even when you run ads, you may have some comments on below the ads, yeah. right? Or I guess, I guess it's never one way. How did you land with this structure, right? Because from the outside, it seems you, you are experimenting a lot. I've seen the API, you just mentioned there was the, the remove background product, which is a way to remove background of images, went pretty viral. And then there is like the three, four teams you just mentioned. How do you think about experimentation? How do you decide which channels you're gonna open, you're gonna close? Over time, there is two different experimentation. Is the example you shared? There is experimentation in areas where I think testing is mandatory. For example, the user acquisition, creative testing on the social platform is, is not like something we wish to do. We have to do it. It's a number game. So the UA team is testing more than 200 ads a week, for example. Same for the onboarding. We have a thousand daily installs. That wouldn't make sense to not iterate on the onboarding and take data data informed decision and learn about our users. And then there is more like company or team bet, like you mentioned Atlanta. Okay, we are wondering, people were telling us the wrestling community in the US resonated a lot with photo room at the beginning. And we thought, okay, if we go on the street, discussing with them, animating the conference of Swiftcom, Swiftcom is, a, is the biggest reselling conference in the US, they will uh, know better about us and we will improve our awareness, for example, or this kind of stuff. Should we test through, should we sell our API or not? It's more a company bet. And the way we decide there, it starts from the user. So what our users are telling us, so the API is the same. It's someone telling us, okay, Photoroom is amazing, but I would like to remove the background in my app. Do you have an API? Can I use your API? Then we say, okay, why not? Let's assess the opportunity. Let's see if that makes sense or not. So we build a conviction, a mix of data, a mix of user uh, feedback. And from there, you have to pick them because you can't do everything. So you need to focus on some of them and take some bets. And after a few weeks or months, you decide to drop it or not. This is different from the kind of day-to-day -day experimentation that the growth team should do to have impact. And would, would you be able to share with us some examples of bets that worked and it was a surprise and on the other end, things that you expected to work and they just didn't. And maybe if there was any learning in one of these two. <laughs> Definitely the API for Photoroom. It started, as I mentioned, with a few users asking us on support or directly reaching out to founders about our API. So we build the first version, we sell it, it, it worked quite well. And now we are structuring a team. We have a small team dedicated to, to the API. And we think that by having even more focus, we can have another revenue stream coming from there. Some things that didn't work out in bet we did. Thanks to the App Store, Photoroom is available everywhere in the world. But of course, you can't be relevant in, I mean, we're European based. Our app is translated to Japan, but it was automatically translated, absolutely not localized. 
we had some good numbers, but we thought we should improve it. And the learning is if you want to build a local presence with events, it's just not a one-off. It's not just going there. If you want to build awareness locally, you need to have either people who do this for you or you need to go there very often. That's what we are. We try to do after with ThriftCon, for example, in the US, like building our, our presence in events in the US. I think what's important when you do bets like that is to, to be very honest with yourself as a company and define clear success, what success looks like. And after a few weeks or months, decide if you want to drop it or continue invest. And that's, I think, what's difficult because you have tons of opportunity every week and you need to pick them wisely. That's very cool. You said that the things that works or don't work is are because of the the users, right? It's all about the users. So basically, when you folks did the API, you didn't really measure how much people like your technology or something like that. And for the internationalization, it was kind of the other way around. You assumed translating it and doing an event was enough, but actually there is more localization specificities that users want than just the translation. So what do you do with that? Is it now your new framework? When you assess a bet or an opportunity, do you try to really go down to the user needs? It's a mix of user needs. It's a mix of information you get also from the data uh, as well. It's also about building a conviction. In our case, what we learned is running events in Japan is definitely, it's probably not the way to be more present there. Does it mean we should not continue to invest in Japan? Probably not because we have other data points, other feedbacks that shows that every time someone with a bit of influence on TikTok share about photo rooms, there is uh, traction. So it means that yes, photo room is appealing in Japan, but to be known there, it's probably not three events. It's maybe it's working with a PR agency. It's maybe it's also having content, which is more appealing to Japanese uh, user, uh, celebrating then Gajo, which is a famous event in, in Japan and not uh, Christmas, for example, all these kind of small things. Uh, you can do. Maybe to switch topic a little bit, I listened to a podcast that Mathieu, the CEO of Photoro, did with Harry at 20VC. Yeah. And he mentioned that at the beginning of 20VC, you, you are doing a lot of like testing at McDonald's where you would go to the users and you would pay them burgers for them yeah. to give you it back. So that's interesting from a product standpoint. Now, if we look at it with a gross lens, do you also do that in the gross team? Meaning how important is it for you to iterate on the product? in such a way that you, you know, find ways to activate your growth tactic? I would say it depends on the topic, but when we decide to do significant change in our uh, growth approach, for example, on monetization, we always balance what the data is saying, what are our convictions on this topic, and what our users are saying. So I will take a concrete example. We switch in July from a monthly plan to a weekly plan. On photo room. So photo room is a premium app. You can buy either a yearly subscription or, or now a weekly subscription. It started with a data thought, like maybe we can improve the monetization by incorporating, in, implementing a weekly plan and by running tests. And we, we found out that yes, probably weekly is the best setup in terms of monetization. But for the brand, it's not ideal not to offer a week, a yearly. And we have people who, who know they want to commit to photo room. So before implementing it, we run a, a few years, user survey with people who are using the monthly. If they will be happy to take a weekly plan instead, or will have them be happier with a weekly plan or not. And it ended up that more than the revenue impact that it had, the combination of weekly plus yearly fits much better our users because at Photoroom, either we have users who are immediately convinced that we are saving them time to remove the background, to generate background, to sell better. And those users will take the yearly anyway. We have a tons of users who saw an ad uh, from Photoroom on Meta. They say, okay, why not? Let's try. And those users, a monthly or a weekly is, is the same. They take it to test, to take the trial and they want to test a bit more. So they subscribe. So the weekly is better for them. And for us, it's a nice first step to engage them with our offer, to make them discover the full value of Photoroom. And then we upsell them to a yearly plan because we are convinced that on the long term we'll help them. This is an example. We started with data, but we didn't take just a decision based on data. We incorporated a bit of a uh, lot of feedback from the user. How does the weekly plan compare or the, if you pay for four weeks, how does it compare to the monthly? And what was the cash impact of that? Can you quantify this? 
After one month, if you take the weekly, you pay around 50, depending on the market, because we adapt on market consumer power, but it's around 50, 60% more expensive to take the weekly than taking the, the yearly. And how did you define success of that experiment before running the experiment? Before starting running the experiment, initially, we were looking for an increase of average revenue per user to feed our paid acquisition machine. So our goal was to increase our one year average revenue per user, not only looking at the short term, because of course weekly has a high impact on average revenue per user on the short term, but we extrapolated to one year. That's why we have run tests on this for more than six months to make sure uh, we're doing the right choice. And uh, yeah, that was our main metric, like improving the one year average revenue per user and still be reasonable in terms of options we offer to our user. But there is also the fact that as our subscription project is much more robust than it was two years ago. So there is also a logic. We combine this with some price increase as well. So there is a logic of optimizing our pricing for what the product is today, per market, etc. But yes, at the end of the day, the goal is to give more room to the paid acquisition team to scale further. Great. And maybe, Enzo, that's a good transition towards the next topic, which is social media and ads. Yeah, I think there are two roads here we can take, and I would actually be keen to touch on both. For sure, the first one is like ads and running ads. And I think it's very interesting to see how you look at it with like, on the one end, the cost up front of running some of these ads versus on the other end, what you're going to get long term. And it's one of these challenges that startups have, right? Unless you can really estimate that, it's very hard to pump the budget. But unless <laughs> you put a bit of budget into that, you're never going to be able to start really the machine, right? So when I look at, at you guys on social media, you're big, like without the ads, right? I I, th I think I found almost a million followers on Instagram and 300,000 on TikTok. You worked also with influencers. So you do a bit of co-marketing maybe to promote the app. You mentioned Japan seems to be one of these potentially placed. How do you think about the growth on this platform, the paid versus the earn, the community approach? Maybe if we can take it from there, how do you think about running ads? It would be very uh, excited to hear. Yeah, since the beginning, I mean, Photoroom is a very visual product. So for us, it was uh, kind of obvious to be uh, be active on social platform, uh, especially Instagram first, and then we find a natural also affinity with TikTok. People who are exposed to Photoroom ads follow our Instagram account, so it's it's organic. We never pay for any follower on on Instagram, but it's directly impacted by our ads ads budget. I'm less expert on TikTok, but I guess there is also an impact there. So that's for how our social media account has grown. And it's also true that especially last year, we are working with more than 100 TikTok creators all over the world that are promoting photo room. And we approach them with a community perspective. They produce content regularly. And usually they were using photo room before promoting content about photo room. So they are user by first. And the way we are running ads at Photo Room is very related to the beauty of uh, the app ecosystem. But what's beautiful with a consumer subscription is you offer a trial, three days or seven days. And if you bring enough value to the user and if they subscribe with a yearly plan, you get immediately one year of value after just three or seven days. And in terms of cash efficiency, it's just magical because you can fit the machine. And if you start having great uh, monetization metric, it's just something that you can stack month after month. You basically reinvest all the cash you are making into your gross paid acquisition machine. And this is what we have done. And that's also why we have gone that fast with very little capital used. You get the money on the bank account right away when people pay yearly, minus the commission of Apple or whatever. And now at our scale, that works when your payback window is less than 30 days which was the case of Photoroom at the beginning and which is the case of successful apps of the app store. Most of them started with a very short uh, payback window. Now, of course, we have a UA team. We are 50 at Photoroom. We are able to predict better. We have also more historical data. So we know better after one year how many people churned, how many people renewed. So we are able to recalculate it and be more aggressive. If your product brings value to user and users are ready to pay for it, it's one of the easier markets to grow here. Crazy. Yeah, I think it brings an interesting question mark though, which is like, what's really the value of the AR that you bring? Because de facto, you're spending as close as how much revenues you're making on this subscription. So my, the VC in me says, yeah, okay, great. But like, what's really the value of this AR versus the AR of a traditional, you know, B2B SaaS company? Doesn't change the fact that Photorum is probably one of the most, if not the most cash efficient company I've seen because I think you raised 2 million or burn 2 million to get too close to 50 million in there, which is really 
mind blowing. But one question on this actually is like, how much did you push the paybacks? Did you go beyond the yearly subscription revenues that you would make? Like, would you push CAC paybacks at like 15 months and actually take a bet there? Or you would always limit it to 12 months? I mean, we tested it. We push it also step by step. And this is maybe something that I can share a, a bit more broadly is I will never recommend anyone to start with a one year uh, payback window. You should start with 30 days and step by step increase it and see how it impacts your volume and how it impacts your metrics. So sometimes it makes sense on some markets to take bigger risk. It also depends on the market. You don't take the same risk in the US that you will take in Indonesia, Mexico, tier three markets. It's more stable. It's uh, more competitive. Usually retention uh, is higher. Which makes sense, right? Like if you know that you're going to keep the user, you know it's going to keep on paying the year after. So you're happy to take longer bets on longer head paybacks. To wrap up on the product side and, and the ads, and I think everything we, we talk about, we can put it in perspective. You talk about like this new pricing being a way to get more people through the door with a plan that was more suited to their needs or their, their behaviors. You talk about having a growth teams. I wonder about changing the early funnel of the product. I wonder how much would you recommend a company yeah. to experiment on their activation, onboarding flows, everything in the beginning of their journey when they're starting versus just delivering the core value? Because there seems to be just this very big yeah. topic in startup world of like, how much do we focus on activation versus how much this is just over-engineered and we should just move on to the core value prop? No, today we keep experimenting every week on onboarding and activation, but Photoroom has downloaded under a thousand times a day today. So not doing it wouldn't make sense. But when I joined Photoroom three years ago, the team was the founders, because the, the team was a founder and one developer, was known to have the most efficient onboarding in, in the App Store. Apple was uh, recommending them and many app store experts were recommending Photoroom because Photoroom onboarding was all about delivering the core value, which was removing background instantly and goes right into the app. There was no logging, no question, nothing. Just take a picture, see the magic, go into the app. You've been like a strong promoter of like the new Apple way of pushing the, the product without the login and all the paywalls and so on. The, 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 the Apple relationship is always a love and hate relationship. I remember when I worked at N26, it was just amazing when we were featured on the store. I assume it's still a yeah. thing like, how do you influence Apple these days? Do you guys try to get close to them? Do you have a relationship with them? Yeah. Not really. With Apple, the Apple friendship, we have a very close relationship, not necessarily to get featured because today, I mean, of course, at the beginning, it was one of the drivers of uh, Photoroom growth, being featured, being, yeah, being featured in several markets was, of course, driving uh, more installs and more learnings, etc. Today, at our stage, compared to, uh, to our paid acquisition, uh, getting featured is not about the performance. So the relationship with Apple is more about learnings. The Apple French team uh, knows very well the app market. They are discussing with app developer every day. What's important to me is to be very transparent with them. This kind of discussion is more, much more valuable than getting featured or absolutely looking for a featuring from Apple. We spoke a lot about mobile, but I actually have a question, which is, okay, mobile was super important in order to grow the business to where it is today. And a lot of the acquisition was really mobile first. But at some point, you also decided to go to desktop and try to build a collaborative software. Can you explain how you think about growth for the desktop app? Is my first question. And maybe the second one is like, how do you think about multi-seats and this collaborative feature of Photoroom on, on desktop? Yes, today the growth on desktop is mostly driven by SEO. We are building tools that are appealing to users and that answering a big user uh, query, like removing a background, like blur your background, like add an image to your photo, etc., etc. Uh, so we build tools that are driving SEO traffic to the website. And that's the challenge is to make the user see the value of the web app and from there monetize. So we have on the web, we have a traditional SEO that will probably expand in, in the future to a paid search and play, but still targeting mostly consumer people selling online, but mostly on desktop. And where collaboration come into place is, for example, you have your Shopify store and selling jewelry and you have someone from your team taking the picture on this phone and uh, you are editing the Shopify store. That's one of the reasons we build also the desktop version is a lot of sellers are on a multi-device. So that's why we are also investing into this collaboration. It's quite intuitive that many e-commerce sellers are not alone and they also need 
to sell online and have better photo to sell online. How did you make organic work for the desktop? What kind of ways do you have to grow the organic the desktop app when your app is primarily mobile first? Yeah, we do have a web app, which is uh, on par with a mobile app. But the way the website has grown, is CEO play about building those tools. And those tools are on one end pushed in a way by the content that the SEO and content team is promoting on the blog. And at the same time, as AI is quite hot, as also we are investing a lot on uh, social ads, we get a lot of backlinks of people mentioning photo room or doing videos or TikTok about photo room with a link. And our backlink strategy today is exclusively organic. Makes total sense. Actually. That's super cool. So again, it's all about the user value, right? It's about, okay, where else our customers are? They also use their laptop to do their job. What yeah. can we do to deliver value as fast as possible? This kind of feature page or things like that. And then it's gross, right? It's like figuring the right acquisition channel. That is exciting. So do you see then these two, pro like web and, and mobile as being two different products? Or are you trying to move one from the other? Because you feel that, you know, some people are more suited to do their job on the desktop versus some people are more suited to do the job on the mobile. The web app. Is a mobile app is one product, is a photo room, is what photo room product, but it needs to fit different usage. You may see more collaborative feature potentially on the desktop in the future, while on mobile will potentially focus a bit more on the camera, which is quite logical in a way. But the idea is to have one product that fit different usage. Same as when we do acquisition, we do mostly consumer acquisition on Meta, TikTok, etc. And we acquire users who download photo room just for fun, but are ready to pay. People who download photo room for their social media account who are ready to pay. And some of them are selling online. So the product is as it is. It's about making a great picture. And then we, based on the platform, we, of course, invest a bit more on one area or the other. So cross-platform strategy. It's not just like the web is an acquisition channel. It's like, it's part of the product. I love that. Cool. We had one last question on the culture. So at the very beginning, you mentioned that your role in growth was of course to grow the user base and things like that. But also you talk about the organization, grow the people, grow the culture, grow the org. How do you maintain that culture of experimentation, speed and quality? It seems like something you guys really, really nailed. It's a good question. I think one thing that is working uh, well at Photo Room to keep speed, everyone has clear ownership on what they are doing. And as a growth manager at Photo Room, I'm mostly here to coach them, give them the direction where we want to go, challenge them on the day to day, coach them to make sure they stay on the right path, but they have full ownership. And full ownership is, I guess, the biggest reason that make us move that fast. Lovely. Great way to wrap it up. Thank you so much for coming, Oliver. It was great. If people want to follow with you, Where should we point them to? I'm on LinkedIn, of course, and I'm starting building it also to uh, tweeting a bit more. So they can follow me either on LinkedIn or on Twitter. Great. We'll make sure we point to both. Thank you, Luis. Thank you, Oliver. Have a great day. Thanks for listening to this episode of The Seed Stage. The best way to support us is by leaving a five-star review. The team is pushing hard to bring you the best stories and insights, and your feedback helps others discover our podcast too. So please, if you haven't done it, take a moment to leave us a review. This means a lot. Until the next episode, take care.